Welcome to this morning's failure analysis panel discussion. Failure analysis is one of these uh, things that happens after the fact, and manufacturers have to learn uh, from the uh, inspection the lessons uh, to avoid making these recurring problems in the future. I'm joined today by a very distinguished panel to help discuss uh, different approaches to failure analysis uh, from different labs. On my far uh, right, we have Mark McMean from STI Electronics. Good morning. Uh, to, in the middle, we have Rob Brzezinski from Daytest. Uh, and to my right, we have Ashton McCary from Raytheon. Uh, so uh, that's our panel this morning. And I'm going to start with a, a question that they're probably all going to answer a little bit differently. Uh, and that is, uh, when you uh, receive a defective board into your, into your lab, what are the first steps that you take uh, uh, you know, to, to try and diagnose that, that board? Let's start with you, Mark. Yeah, so at STI, one of the first things we do is, is we actually bring the card in and we perform a 610 inspection. So we first classify it as whether it's a class two or class three board. Then we do a full inspection of the board and then we actually t start taking in the electrical test data that was performed on it, whether it's a field failure or whether it was the initial you know, failure through their initial test. So depending on whether it's a field return or an, uh, an in-house test failure, we start with receiving that test data that was originally done on that card. And then from there, we'll, we'll then start taking a look at those components that are in that particular um, system circuit that's causing the problem. And we kind of define what the scope of what that uh, FA is going to look like after that perspective. So we start it with a full inspection to get an idea. Then we take a look at the electrical test date on that particular card or system. And then we take a look at the components that are in that subsystem. From there, then we'll write a, it's almost like a DOE, how we're going to systematically step through the logic depending on what the failure at the system level looks like. Right, okay, so you do that first classification uh, and before writing up the, the approach you're gonna to take to the DOE. Uh, Rob, do you differ from that in any way? Slightly different, but slightly similar. We have two categories of customers. One, very similar, general failure where they're able to provide failure data to us, but not necessarily much in the way of specificity as to which components are failing. The second category, the customer is very specific, where they've invested some of their own time on the bench doing initial troubleshooting, and they've narrowed the failures down to a device or devices, and sometimes even down to the individual pin level, where, for example, they're looking at an FPGA that has failed, the classic case where they press on it and apply power, and it works. When they relieve it of power, it fails. Sometimes they're able to say, limit your search on this device to pins A1 through A8, ignore the rest, and from there we can then focus in and use the technologies that we have to see whether it's a crack, void, head and pillow, cold joint, insufficient solder, whatever the case may be. Right, well that obviously makes the job a lot easier for you when they do a lot of the initial work and just uh, focus in onto the area. Of the concern. difficult one is when the customer simply comes to you and says it failed. <laughs> <You're exactly right. laughs> and we charge by the hour for our services. <laughs> so I will then tell the customer, I'd love to help you. And when we're done, we're going to charge you a boatload of money, which will make us happy. However, <laughs> if we come up with inconclusive results, you're not going to be happy with us. So if we can narrow our search to Whatever you're able to define, however trivial you may think it is, it may be significant to us. So tell us all you know, and that will help us pinpoint what we're trying to look for. Right, right. Now, Ashton, Ra Raytheon obviously does a lot of military work. So do you take a different approach to, to uh, failures when they come back to you? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we, we're internal uh, failure analysis lab. So when we get a failure, we ask a, a lot of questions. Uh, when the failure occurred, when did they notice it, uh, what process up, and we had the benefit of being able to go into the factory to see how they're working on uh, these circuit card assemblies. And not all of our failures are related to electrical failures, so some of it's uh, due to improper materials used or um, uh, improper soldering or which would be electrical, but then also adhesive failures and things like that or uh, mixing conformal coats improperly. So 
we'll look at their assembly instructions uh, for the the board that they're working on and then we'll ask a lot of questions when they notice the failure occur and then we'll also uh, document like crazy so we'll take pictures of the board before we ever touch it and then we'll uh, think about uh, we, we have a team of electrical engineers, a physicist, a mechanical engineer, and then a couple of chemists and material scientists. We'll work as a team to kind of discuss the best approach of how we look into the failure. Right, right. Okay. Um, so what, I mean, what about the, the operating environment, um, Mark? I mean, if it's a field failure, then I assume that's going to be pretty high on your list of questions. Uh, what, where was it operating? Was it in a harsh environment? Was it... Uh, right. You know? Yeah, very good question. We start trying to understand the environment in which it was operating in and failed in, and, and it's really a forensics review. You're trying to get as much detail um, about its environment, um, how it was acting, um, you know, failure modes can come in all different forms and factors, you know, um, such as, you know, uh, micro fractures that uh, propagate all the way through, um, corrosion, you know, where we've left some unactivated flux residues that, that now allow voltage leakage and things of that nature, where we start dissolving some of the metal oxides and start allowing that to occur. So the idea is to really get as much information from the customer so that you can define that subject around that environment and then start writing a real DOE to go after whatever the problem is. Right, right, okay. Um, Rob, I mean, how much does, um, uh, do, do you also look at how it was manufactured? Um, do, is, is that something you actually look at as well? Yes, very definitely. Mm -hmm. um, we surprisingly take in many boards that were manufactured in China and we ask a few of those basic questions about what the process was and often to our consternation, we find out very little, if any, x-ray inspection was performed on the board, or maybe only the high density components on the board were inspected at the production level. Mm -hmm. And what we end up doing, partly as a defensive measure in those instances, is we scan the entire board. Because in our experience, there is a tendency to assume in the case of failure that it's the BGA that failed or it's the QFN that failed or the highest density device on the board or the connector. And frequently, again, in our experience, we find it elsewhere on the board. Right, right. that's interesting. Okay. Uh, Ashton, is, is miniaturization, um, you know, because things are getting smaller all the time. We're having to pack more electronics into dense, uh, tighter spaces. Um, is that uh, having an impact on the, on the number of um, failures you're seeing coming into your lab? Uh, yes, actually, with the miniaturization. So I'm a chemist, so a lot of the failures that I analyze are due to um, chemical-related failures. So with the miniaturization, contamination seems to be a bigger problem. Uh, even, um, well, you have components that are closer together, so it creates different paths that you don't want. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then also, uh, so for wire bond pads, um, a complete... A, a spit droplet can cover an entire wire bottom pad <clears throat> and create an adhesion failure. Right. And uh, so, yes, definitely. Right. Okay. So, I mean, what percentage of failures are thermally related due to poor design and what percentage are caused by harsh environments? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, harsh environments create really unique situations on the electronics as they're built. So depending on the bond lines and the bond thickness between the thermal planes and, and how it, the, the thermal lug on the component to the thermal plane on the board design can play a large factor, especially as the components are getting smaller and the wattages are going back up. The other side of that equation is, is that harsh environments also create a unique situation where the flux residues, if they're left on the board, can become problematic. That is, at the higher temperature, especially on under uh, um, automotive under hood type applications, that becomes a real challenge because you've got to make sure that when you encapsulate them or underfill them, that you don't trap any other residues underneath them. Right. Because at those temperatures, that becomes the medium for electrochemical migration. Mm -hmm. So the harsh environments really can play a different type of perspective on. Uh, on the electronics itself and it takes a different mindset. We see all kinds of unique failure mechanisms 
when you start raising the temperature um, under devices because of the environment and not properly cleaned underneath the component. Right. I mean, cleaning is such a big issue these days, uh, Rob. I still, I still find it difficult to believe that only 20% of the people that are conformally coating are, are cleaning. Uh, it's, 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 it's ludicrous, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, not only that, but so-called no-clean processes impose certain problems unique to themselves. Uh, we do various types of electrical testing and often we have to deal with boards that came out of a no clean process and we've got a residue to penetrate and when you're testing with a flying probe tester trying to drive a probe through what is essentially chewing gum for descriptive purposes makes it very difficult. The troubleshooting time on a board like that where you will get literally hundreds of false opens on a large card can be days if not weeks and that's a case where I often go to the customer and say again before we do this and before you get a substantial bill you need to understand what we're up against here and you can either take this back and perform a thorough cleaning or we're gonna slog through it but you're gonna suffer the consequences of that when we're done mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing cleaning is, 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 is a given with uh, the sort of things that you're building uh, Ashton um, Let's move on. I've got a question here. I mean, insufficient paste is typically the single biggest defect that comes off the printer. You know, the industry typically says that we get 70% of the defects emanating from the printer. And of these defects, insufficient paste is, is the biggest one. Does that translate into some of the, the findings that you have in the, in, the, in, the, in the lab? Not with the failures that I've worked with. I'm sure it is a problem that that would be something our electrical engineers would... Right. catch more so. Okay. Do you have a view on that? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I agree with, with what the industry says. I have a unique perspective because I have a failure analysis lab as well as a contract manufacturing arm yeah. building military and aerospace uh, critical parts. Yeah. Um, and, the, and under class three, you really want to make sure that you have sufficient solder fillet formation. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is, is that it's the number one thing coming off our printer that we have to verify. And then we have to, you know, touch it up before we, you know, start applying the parts and everything of that nature. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of effort understanding our first pass yields on printing, but mm -hmm. printing both in our FA lab as well as in our own production is our number one uh, continuous improvement continuous project. Improvement project. Rob, do you have a view on that? I would concur with what Mark said and only add that uh, a large portion of the failures, particularly voiding and solder flow issues, are the direct result of poor paste deposition. We see it almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, we get hired quite often to perform void measurements and benchmarking for both OEM customers as well as EMS companies. And... Um, one byproduct of automation increased placement speed these days is we create these defects at a faster rate. And that sounds cynical from a business standpoint, but from where we sit, that happens to be the reality. Okay. Uh, I'm guessing that you probably have a lot of issues with voiding as well in, in, in your failure analysis lab. Uh, yes, we do. We see a lot of uh, adhesive voiding underneath uh, small components and then uh, solder voiding as well. Okay. What about warpage? Is that is that an issue that you, you get a lot of uh, issue with? So warpage, I don't see that a lot in my area of the mm -hmm. lab. So our mechanical engineer potentially, but no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so let me move on a little bit. I mean, I want to ask how effective you think that the current IPC design guidelines um, are and uh, what would you do to improve? <laughs> yeah, I believe that if we can get get both the IPC design guidelines, which are our system designers, and the manufacturing process engineers to start talking and actually start moving in a conversation that allows us to address both sides. It's too easy for a designer to design a board and it just works, right? Because in right. his mind, he's got all the system and electrical objectives onto the board and it's working. So his component placements he doesn't want to change because he has that's his baby. He's designed it and it works electrically. Not all system design boards can be manufactured as reliably as others. 
So if we could if we could improve the communication between the IPC guidelines and the manufacturing guidelines and co-blend those in the future, especially as density and the miniaturization drives to a smaller form factor, mm -hmm. we'll be able to then be able to build a more reliable board. Right. And that's the biggest challenge because too many times the system is designed, it gets thrown to manufacturing before they get time to work it to say, hey, this is a really tight, complex area. If we could relay that, we could have better yields, we can have um, better reliability, and, but too many times you start with the system already designed and then the process guy gets it and then all of a sudden you say, hey, quality reliability engineer, how do I make sure that lot to lot and my long-term reliability meets the, the system objective? And that is a real challenge and my hope is that over the coming years as we shrink the, the density board factors that we actually start blending those two and those three together to better have guidelines that allow us to build boards that are uh, easier to manufacture, thus giving us higher degree of reliability. Right. Well, I mean, what, what you are talking about there is really designed for manufacturing, which, which we've been asking for, looking to close that loop for Exactly, for but it needs to be at the beginning before you get locked in on the system design. Right, but I mean, I think what's happening with this new smart factory initiative that's, that, that's permeating is that the software is going to literally be closing that loop uh, uh, through, the, uh, through some of the new software systems that are coming out from companies like Siemens and uh, uh, there, that is mentioned. that is the dream. That is the hope, and we right. we hope that that actually comes f full fruition right. over these coming years. Right. You're exactly and, and right, one, Trevor. And once you get to the DFM level, then you can start to look at doing uh, design for cleaning and then design for test. So you can actually put various different initiatives into it and, and really build it out into something fairly robust. Uh, I would add two comments to that. One. The, the 900 pound gorilla in the room, in my opinion, is DFR, which is designed for reliability. Mm. Far too many engineers are satisfied when it comes off the line and it passes the requisite electrical tests. Their job is done. Their life is complete. Where we see failing products is after they've failed after seven months in the field, perhaps in a harsh environment, perhaps under intense mechanical strain and we get tasked with figuring out what went on to cause that failure. Um, very little resources and know-how to date has been devoted to analyzing reliability and the predictive aspect of reliability. How long is this product actually gonna work in the field? Mm -hmm. Secondly, a specific example that we deal with a lot is voiding beneath QFNs and other high density devices. As we all know, IPC only defines void thresholds for BGA balls. The rest are undefined and it's right. a raging debate. So we are often forced to simply pre present the results to the customer and say it's undefined as far as IPC is concerned. You need to work with your OEM or your CM as the case may be and determine whether this is suitable for your performance requirements in the field. All we can do is present the data and then they have to act on it. So so are you saying that uh, IPC guidelines on, on voiding only relates to the volume of the void and not the uh, the location of the void and the amount of, of connection it has with the interface? Primarily, yes, and specifically with BGA balls. They have not defined it for thermal pads beneath other devices yet, like QFNs, for example. Mm -hmm. So all that we can do, exactly right. all yep. that we can do is measure it, provide the data to the customer. If we're asked our opinion, we can offer an opinion, mm -hmm. and then they have to decide if those results are going to achieve what they want for system performance. We can't make that decision for them. Uh, let me add one quick note to Robert. Robert's making the perfect example. Mm -hmm. Uh, IPC is working on determining what these voids can and their size and their location be in the future. But today, as Robert has just said, it is being decided by the CM and the end customer, whoever that may be, mm -hmm. to discern that. So in some cases, I'm getting specs pushed down to us to manufacture that says it's got to be 90% filled with only 10% voids. 
Right. Okay. And that void then has to be of a certain size. You know, I can have two, but I can't have this one large one. So some, some customers are taking a very conservative approach because we don't have the guidelines yet. There's, a, there's some ongoing studies right now that are going on in the industry to collect the data to address the, the, the perfect analogy that, that uh, Robert brought up. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is, in the interim, with no guidance, that's left up to the customer and the CM to say it. So in some cases, we can see 90%, 80%, 70%. And then you have the flip side, the guy that says, hey, I don't care. I'll right. accept 40%. Right. Now, as a lab, I have a problem when we start you know, making that. Because remember, the whole intent of that big thermal pad was the thermal transfer yeah. you know, down to the plane. You start having 40% voiding. You've got an issue. You, you, got, you, you start having a thermal potential issue. Yeah. So in some cases, we're forced to go back and do thermal analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a very good point. Yeah. Ashton, do, do the current IPC guidelines uh, meet your requirements, or do you have to write a lot of internal uh, additional guidelines? We have to write a lot of internal additional guidelines, uh, mm -hmm. especially regarding cleaning. They're not all of our boards pass mm -hmm. the IPC uh, cleaning standard according to the, the ROSE testing, and but our boards still require more cleaning than what the IPC states, states is needed. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know that we're under a time constraint here, uh, gentlemen So and ladies. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to end our discussion here. Um, I want to thank you very much for joining us. It's a, a great topic. Uh, we could discuss it for a, long, uh, a lot more time if we had it. Uh, but for the meantime, I want to thank Mark McMean from STI Electronics um, and uh, Rob Bajuski from Daytest and Aston McCary from uh, Raytheon. Raytheon. <laughs> And thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Trevor. Okay, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you.